Hey, dear listeners, on this week's episode, we have Haley Williams, lead singer and songwriter of the rock band Paramore. I found Haley to be so open hearted, genuine, and reflective. Even non musicians will relate when she compares being in a band to touring solo. Haley's take on what qualities to look for in a partner are just as inspiring, while her in sync fan letter gives a glimpse into the rock star she becomes. Later in the episode, April and I talk with a listener who has health issues which prevent her from having children, and she doesn't know how or when to bring this up with potential partners. All right, everyone, here's Haley Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Unqualified with your host, Anna Ferris. Hi! Hi! Hi, Haley! It's so good to meet you! Yours was the first podcast I ever listened to. Really? Yes! I'm so excited to be on it. Oh my god, Haley, that is so nice to hear. I wasn't expecting like a cool compliment like that. I'm always really moved if I run into anybody in the outer world. If they're like, hey, I'm a podcast listener, it feels almost like a club. Oh, yeah. They're like cool about it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It's been awesome. You started early, too. I feel like you got on the podcast thing very early. Yeah. I was nervous to talk with you because... Really? (laughs) Yeah. Like, I'm a fan of musicians, but it's a subcategory of people that I haven't been exposed to much in my life. Oh, totally. And so when we have them on the podcast, I feel like I don't know enough (laughs) about that world. Anyway, I so want to get into it. Oh, I'm excited. (laughs) Hey, Haley, what's your comfort level in having like an intimate discussion with somebody for an hour and a half (laughs) that you've never (laughs) met before? (laughs) Honestly, I feel like my comfort level's too comfortable to the point where now I'm like, am I one of those like oversharing, very obnoxious? Because, you know, I also write for my life. Oh, God, Haley, that didn't even occur to me that like as an actor, you're exposed, but at least you're saying somebody else's words. Yeah, honestly, though, because I I remember there being like a moment in time, it was probably after the band like started to get popular, where an agent would be like, hey, we need like an alt rock chick in this movie or in the, you know, we want you to try out. And it's weird because I don't know what it's like for you to think about what I do and that being vastly different from, you know, reading a line or even improv. Like for me, I get to like really pour over what I'm saying and I get to think about it and I get to rework it until it's ready. And then I go out there and put it into the world. But something about trying out for a movie and saying things that I didn't come up with, it didn't sit right with me. So I couldn't ever put myself there genuinely to even try to step into that world. It just seems, I don't know how y'all. Haley, in like most stuff, like when you get rejected after an audition for so long, I totally shouldered it. Uh. Like, I don't know if I did a bad job. And it's only until I got older that it was like, no, that was just really shitty writing. (laughs) Like you tried to do something kind of weird with it and they couldn't fucking handle it. (laughs) But for so long, it was like, oh, I'm not pretty enough. I'm not like Uh. whatever. So I guess that with age, I guess there's a little liberation in that. But in terms of exposure, like, yeah, I bet that people in your life and your fans are analyzing, of course, your lyrics. And as you write, do you feel like you have to almost write in code sometimes? I think I did that more as a teenager, to be honest, like whether it was because maybe I was crushing on someone and I couldn't bear to be honest about it or whether it was like, you know, maybe I wasn't sure how to talk about depression and I was embarrassed about that. Now that I'm older, I think that I can understand that with age and some experience, like there's a liberation that happens where now I almost feel like the more vulnerable I am, the more I'm protected, which might be backwards in actuality, but it's helped me. Yes, I'm so with you. The podcast has actually given that to me. Oh, that's so interesting. I mean, you've been really vulnerable too. And I can see how you claiming your own space to talk about whether it's your own personal experiences or getting into other people's 
like you set up the boundaries around it. And so I could see that feeling really liberating and really safe. And I really take pride in that I think that we have a reputation of protecting celebrities. Yeah. That's hugely important to me, like way over success. Like I want this to be a place where people feel safe. Yeah. So I want to ask you about high school. Ouchie. Um, so it was like a A plus experience. <laughs> I mean, you know, what is so weird is that I, my mom is like on this home video kick lately where she's digitizing a lot of our memories and, oh God, Haley. Oh, it's traumatizing, man. Yes, of course it is. She keeps sending them to me and I'm like, I, I can't. Yeah. So I'm just like, delete, <laughs> delete, delete. But I like, honestly, what struck me the craziest was like, I seemed really chaotic and happy on a camera, you know? And I don't know if it's because the camera was around or what, because my actual memories of growing up in Mississippi, it's not like they're all doom and gloom, but I have a lot of really sad or troublesome kind of memories of broken home stuff and bad, toxic household with my mom's second husband. And for me, so much of my life started when we got to Nashville but my last year in Meridian, Mississippi, was my best, I think. And I, I feel like it's because mom and I started to run away. And like we were living in friends' homes, kind of like hiding out before we took off. And there was like an adventure to it that I was so desperate for. And I played basketball. I was on the basketball team, at the junior varsity team. And I really loved that. But yeah, I mean, that's the last of my real especially my positive memories of Mississippi. But then we came here where I'm at now in Nashville and it really did feel like my life started over. I got to reset. My mom got to reset. The rest of my family ended up coming up to here, uh, like my dad's side. So Haley, you're in Nashville now? Yeah, yeah. I lived in LA for three years in my early 20s, but I just, I can't stay away from here. I've never been to Nashville. I've always wanted to go. Please come here. Like, I know it's a city I will love. Yeah, it, it really is. So pretend like you're a little bit of a tour guide for a second. Like, okay. sell me on Nashville. What can I expect? Well, you don't want to get stuck downtown because you'll hate it. I find that, like, the touristy spots in Nashville are not where the magic is. It never has been. The, like, little pockets in the east side and little pockets that we refer to as old Nashville, like our, like, locals here, that's the stuff that rules. So old Nashville. Yeah, yeah. I would say like the hip, cool part of town is east. Um, it's the part that's been coming up over the last six years or so, 10 years maybe. And that's where like really good vegan restaurants and great coffee and, you know, but there's little pockets all over town. And I mean, I feel like since I've been home with the pandemic and coming off the road and all that stuff, I feel like I've become more... Uh, attached to the scene and the local community, especially like organizations that are started by young people in Nashville. What are the people like? Oh, everyone's kind. I mean, at least the people that I know and that are in sort of the bubble that I'm a part of in Nashville, everyone's really for each other. So if you're an artist and you move to Nashville, it won't take you long to meet other people that are like-minded or that want to help you and connect you. We're not very protective of our scene in like a, an exclusive way. We really want people to come into it and feel empowered. I, I would say, if I had to sum it up, I think we're a really connected city. So as big as we've gotten, it still feels like a small town, you know? Like when you go to the coffee shop, do you run into the same people every day? Like, yeah, I mean, I'm now that I don't, I don't go to the east side quite as much, but Depending on which coffee shops I go to, I usually know who's working or, you know, our drummer, Zach, his brother and sister-in-law have a donut company and they sell to all the coffee shops in town. So like everywhere I go, there's some sort of connection to friends or family or maybe people we grew up playing music with. And it's really, I, it's so endearing and I'm, I'm really glad that hasn't gone away. I love that. Haley, were you raised to be religious? Like, did you attend church and youth groups? Well, yeah, like Nashville is the Bible Belt, right? And I had come from Mississippi, which was even more deeply ingrained in like Southern Baptist traditions. And then I moved here and it was all about like non-denominational churches. And you're really kind of like, you don't really have a choice as a kid. 
I mean, obviously you're with your parents, you're doing what they do, but even as you get a little older and youth group becomes a thing. And for me, it was always social. It was like, well, this is where my friends are. This is where like a cute guy is and I'm trying to see him or whatever. Was there a lot of like, in terms of being a woman? To be really honest with you, I feel like my memories of being in the church as a teenager, especially like a prepubescent teenager and then becoming like a young lady in the church. I almost feel like women weren't spoken to as people who have primal desires or whether it's sexuality or whether it's just like raw emotions, rage, any of that stuff. Because I don't know if it was more religion talking or just Southern tradition, but like there's a type of person that I think is projected onto a young woman in the South, right? Especially a young white woman in the South, there's just this like social component that has to be, all the boxes have to be checked off. And I never felt like I fit that. But now when I think back, I really feel like guys had it worse because I can just remember like sitting at youth group and it being like so much shame onto young boys about their sexuality and what they did with it, you know? And that's not even touching the topic of whether or not you identify one way or another or who you're attracted to. It was just like, if you have that feeling, it's wrong. Yeah, but I didn't escape that either. You didn't? Mm -mm. No, my parents were virgins when they got married. Whoa. And they wanted that for me. And I think it's because my dad was the intellectual side. My mom grew up quite poor And I think there was a lot of, like, I was witness to a lot of pretty awful stuff. So she passed that on to me, like, in good ways and bad ways, I think. Like, ways that I really struggled with. But in ways that I think have permeated other parts of my life in terms of my sense of self-worth, maybe. My pride, like... Yeah. Yeah. That (laughs) was so... (laughs) We went from Nashville. Oh, yeah, yeah. (laughs) We've jumped all over the place. But I really like how you described it. Oh, yeah. I grew up in Seattle in the 90s, and it was still a place of economic depression. There was a lot of, like, timber jobs, a lot of, like, Boeing jobs that had moved away. And it wasn't until, like, Microsoft and whatever came along, hence grunge. And I think that I could generalize people of Seattle being very polite and respectful and closed, kind of closed off. They don't extend themselves. Like I would never describe the people of like New Orleans as (laughs) (laughs) like closed. (laughs) That's so interesting because what I would say is that the people here give the perception of being very open and hospitable and polite for sure. But my opinion of the South in general can sometimes be tainted by my upbringing in Mississippi where Stuff sometimes just felt self-cannibalizing, almost, like, community-wise. Like, there didn't seem to be enough support for the other, you know. And here in Nashville, I do think there's a lot of support for the other. You're always reaching out and trying to connect or your friends, you know, inviting you to a cookout. I think on Mayim's podcast, you said that, like, you always kind of knew that you were meant to get out. And I felt the same way. Like, my community felt too small. And I was always struggling with, like, the desire to fit in, but not wanting to compromise my own uniqueness. (laughs) I wore a Christmas tree skirt around (laughs) as a cape, a red one. When I was in high school, Haley. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. We would have been friends. I love that. That's amazing. I was like... I was asking for, like... (laughs) To be bullied and shit. Yes, totally. What was that like, though? Like, A, were you already working? Were you already busying yourself with maybe what your dreams were in any degree? And B, did you have friends that you felt like were your real friends? I kind of did. I felt like I was always involved with girls who were stabbing each other in the back or doing something mean to me. There was always, like mean friend drama like I remember like feeling hurt a lot but yeah so of course I wanted to escape yeah I mean I get that I relate (laughs) 
Kids are mean. Fuck, they really are. And it's hard to be a young girl. I have an 18-year-old sister and I have a 25-year-old sister. And each of us have had such different experiences of growing up. Just being like a young teenage girl in the school system was, for me, a nightmare because I don't know if it was like hormones or just we were all figuring out who we were. It's just all of the above. But I get the idea that being a young girl right now, it just isn't quite the same. At least I hope people have more empathy for each other or a bit more patient and accepting. But I don't know, maybe that's just like an Instagram filter that I'm seeing. I don't know. (laughs) That might be what it is. I know. I hope so too, Haley. Yeah. And too, like being a creative person, I think when you're too young to actually like go out and make it happen for yourself. And you're still obviously figuring out who you are, but you have a drive and you're really creative. I do think that creative people can be easy targets or we just don't make it easy for ourselves in those settings, whether it's school or I felt so different and I resented being different, but I also didn't want to be like anyone at the same time. Completely. It felt like I was so afraid of rejection that I had to proactively like be on my my God. And then you went into a job where you you're like, reject me all the time. (laughs) Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. And after the past year, I realized I might have been pretty happy just knitting hats and selling them at a farmer's market. But I fucking get it, man. Like, I thought I was going to quit music when I got married for the first time. I was like, I don't need any of this. Like, I'm just going to be at home and make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for my kids that I didn't have, by the way. <laughs> like, I don't know. I think I romanticize whatever I don't have. And that's something I'm working on, like, now actively in therapy. Do you mean the grass is always greener? Yeah, I kind of, I am a grass is always greener person. And my therapist yesterday, she said, you know, right now in your life, you don't have anything that you need to actively fix. Like you're not escaping a trauma. You're not like running away from anything. Like your life has kind of leveled to a place where you've been home. There's routines, all of that. And so she said, it, my opinion is watching you, you're like squirming because you don't know what to do without some sort of dysfunction or traumatic moment. And I hate that about myself, but it's so true. I don't know what to do with peace. Yeah, I know. And my fiance, I think, has really helped me with that feeling. Oh, that's awesome. And as a result, I get to enjoy the moment because I don't know, there's something really peaceful and amazing about that. That's fucking awesome. Like right now, (laughs) I love talking to you. Oh my God, I'm loving this too. I mean, I think because I've been off for so long, like this podcast and I did Mayim's podcast is like the first real, like it doesn't feel like an interview, so I don't want to call it that, but it's really the first public type things that I've done. Even when I released the last record, I don't know, I stayed very insulated on purpose. And it's, this is so nice. I'm loving doing these because, I mean, A, it's so cool to talk to you. I feel like I grew up with you and watching you. And it's just very, very amazing to me that I get to have conversations with people that I've looked up to or that I've been inspired by. But it's also like, it's just fucking nice to feel like there's life again, you know? Yes. And there's real shit to talk about and meeting people. I Like, who knows if I would have ever gotten a chance to meet you or have conversations like this. So I'm pumped. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, me too. I'm loving this. Okay, getting back to my list of questions. Are you the kind of person that would sail around the world by yourself? I don't think I would. I hate embarking on anything alone. I don't mind being alone and I recharge that way. But I think that's why I'm in a band. I feel better protected if I'm like, you want to do this with me? Because I really want to do it, but I'm not doing it alone. So I don't think I would. Oh, my God. What an awesome feeling that must be. Like, to have your team. Yeah, I man, putting out two solo records when I'm very much a band person was... I'm glad I did it because it stretched me. It like opened up my heart to new things, but I also hated it. (laughs) I really didn't. I didn't enjoy knowing that I was going to go on the road and basically just be representing my own self. Like that didn't feel good to me. Yeah. I think that like you should do things that (laughs) make you feel good. Yeah. Like I wanted to ask you if you felt pressure because when I've been the lead of things and it's self-imposed, I felt like pressure to not just do performance shit, that element, but to also be a good morale leader. Yes. And when people are resistant, it's exhausting. 
I know what you're talking about because Paramore are a group of very sensitive people. We grew up together. So I think that we've got that going for us. We know each other intimately well and how to like communicate the right way. I mean, it, it's taken almost 20 years, but it's still, especially growing up and each of us having, whether it's, you know, depression or anxiety or, you know, maybe getting more worn out than another band member and ready to go home. Like it can be really hard. I feel like I used to take on this responsibility to keep everyone really perked up. And when I got depression really bad, I just couldn't do it anymore. And in fact, it was such a relief to me, like for them to know, like. Did they come to your side? Oh, yeah. Isn't that interesting? Like how the balance of a relationship, like oftentimes people were close with, like when my mom gets incredibly anxious, it's through the roof and it's really hard to deal with. But when I get even the smallest bit anxious about something, she's the best caretaker and nurturer of that. That's crazy. Yes. Yeah. They were probably really relieved to be able to step up to the plate for you, I would think. Yeah, I got that sense for sure. I mean, I had a pretty unhealthy relationship with letting it really take me down on purpose because I was so tired of being the person that wanted to make everything happen or the person that wanted to say yes to everything, even if some of the other guys couldn't say yes. Like I tried to be that ringleader in a lot of different ways. And then it was relieving when I just gave up. And I did it very publicly. It was like around the time, you know, I got a divorce. And then, of course, you know, when you're in any form of public eye, you have to announce that you're getting a divorce as if it's <laughs> as, as if that's news. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> I know you do. Yeah. I can remember the night that I had to put that announcement out. You know, my bandmates being like and our crew, which we grew up with our crew, too. We were somewhere in Germany. I think we were in Berlin. And. They knew it was happening, and I told them, I'm not going to have my phone. I don't want to be on the internet. I don't want to see what people say. And we had a show the next night, so I knew whatever I was going to go through, I needed to, like, nip it in the bud. And they all met me at this pizza place. Like, they kind of showed up and surprised me at because I thought I was just going with Brian, my friend, and he does hair and makeup, too, on the road. And everyone was there, and we had wine, and we ate pizza, and, like, hung out for a really—I mean, we all ended up hanging out until, like, 4 or 5 in the morning— and it was just because they knew I needed to be distracted. And I don't think I ever gave them a chance to show up for me that way. But it was good. It was a good memory. That's awesome. Have you traveled a lot, like, outside of work? No, I haven't. Yeah, I was worried about that. <laughs> yeah, I'm worried about it, too. I'm, like, desperate to go back to England, like, to see a couple of friends or, you know, take a train to Paris and just eat all the bread that I can eat. Um, I have a friend who, uh, her family's from Tel Aviv, and I'm, I always kind of like joke with her that I'm going to get in her suitcase. But, you know, when you travel for your job all the time, you find your vacation time in your house. Like now I've had an extra year of vacation time I wasn't expecting. So I'm so ready to leave. I want to explore something with you. Okay. We were talking a lot about dating apps with like some of the callers in April. And we were talking about people who say they like to travel and probably believe they like to travel. <laughs> right. <laughs> but don't like to travel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. I do like to travel, but I also think I prefer being with someone like my fiance to share the experience with. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even know the answer to that for me, to be honest with you. I think I like it. Now you ha really have me curious about whether or not, like, let's say I went overseas without our tour manager for the first time. Like, yeah. am I so dependent on these helpers that are, you know, family to us on the road? And like I said, I don't think I would ever sail anywhere by myself because I like having someone to either bounce ideas off and talk with, or I just like the safety and numbers. I don't know, but I almost did it during the pandemic. I was like, I'm just going to drive with my dog out to LA and stay at my friends who I know is, she's been quarantining and she's a photographer and she was out of work and going crazy. And I was going crazy because I wasn't going on tour. And I was like, maybe this is what I do. I just go and stay with a friend for the remainder of this time. And I never ended up doing it. But that kind of travel sounds fun. It's not too late. Why aren't you going now? No, it's not. At least, like, I don't know, see if it's something you're into. 
I should. I would drive an hour and a half to the airport when I was in high school and just sit in the terminal late at night. You love travel. Like, my heart would be aching. I didn't realize that SeaTac may be closed at one point. (laughs) This janitor came over and asked me if I needed any help. I guess I did. (laughs) Holy shit, yeah. But that's so sweet and romantic that you did that. That sounds like a character in a movie that I would love to watch. Do you know what I mean? Like Amelie or someone who is like, has these romantic longings and pleasures that you seek out and make for yourself. I love that. It left me vulnerable in relationships, though. Re- oh, yeah. Yeah. That quality was like, here you go. <laughs> I hurt just hearing that because I feel like some part of me gets that. Longing has been a very interesting word This is very random what I'm about to say. And I don't feel like someone who tells this story a lot simply because it involves a singer that I grew up loving and I always feel name droppy. But one of my therapists at a certain point over the last four years after my divorce sent me to Amy Grant's house. He was just like, you need to meet Amy Grant. And I was like, okay, love her records. Oh my God. She already seems angelic. The best. So I imagine you walking into like a house of light. (laughs) (laughs) The best person and the most cozy, beautiful household. And she's married to Vince Gill, which is like, there was just, I mean, they'd probably be mortified me talking about it. Like he came home from the guitar store. It was just very like, of course, this is happening when I'm here at Amy Grant's house. But she talked to me so much about just a terrible divorce she went through and falling in love with Vince and like having all, you know, like an aching longing that she feels like makes her not only love her husband, but like her husband. And I just remember thinking like, oh, the word longing, it resonates in me so heavily. And I don't even always know what it relates to. I just as a kid, I was longing as a teenager. I was longing. And even when you know, the band was like on top of the world and we were doing things for the first time that were so crazy. There was always a part of me and it got me into trouble a lot, which is why I say like, when you say it was hard for your relationships, I relate to that getting me into trouble too, that like longing feeling. Can you identify what the longing was for? Well, I think I could guess a lot. I feel like most of my deepest wounds or deepest things that really got set in to my foundations or just because of my parents growing up and they divorced. I was like a very dreamy, romantic kid. And I was like, why is this happening? Every time we went to the mall, I would throw pennies in the wishing well and just be like, please get back together. (laughs) I was like, I just was longing for some version of my life that I thought I would never get. And then I became a teenager. My parents became friends again and they never dated again. At that point, I didn't really long for that, but I was always longing for what I didn't have. And I do think that that got set in with my parents' divorce, and then it sort of became applied to other things throughout my life. It was just a groove that was worn so deep. It was comfortable. That was a comfortable feeling for me. That made me think about if you are like me in the sense that I was never comfortable with the idea of a man taking care of me in any way. Yeah. I think that that idea, I guess, made me not feel safe at all being taken care of because my mom, she was determined to make me some kind of badass or something. I mean, I was furious at the world for, like, the inequality. Like, I felt injustice, like, you know. But what has been fucking rad, Haley, about getting older... (laughs) has really been letting go of so much of that. Like, not being as comparative, Mm. you know, just appreciating. Yeah. This last year, we have stayed at, like, Post Ranch Inn, which is incredible, and Big Sur, and Motel 6s, and parking lots. And every time, it has just been a joy. It's been just so nice for me to... Remember the world outside of entertainment, having lived in Los Angeles for 20 years and that being my whole whirlpool of thought, you know? I feel like film, TV, all of that in L.A. seems like, I always think the music scene is a small world, but we aren't 
typically relegated to like one or two cities. You know, you mostly hear about actors and production companies being in New York or L.A. And musicians aren't really like that. And I always wondered what that was like to be sort of stuck in the place where all the work is and where your peers tend to live. Like, did you ever want to get away more than just traveling for a little bit? Like, did you rebel against it for a while or what? No, I didn't give myself the opportunity. Mm. I was like full accelerator. It felt like taking jobs because I was scared that I wasn't going to get another one. That is like the life of an actor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I don't know what I expect, but music and entertainment people... I don't know. I tried so hard to not get caught up in what I think of as like a upper echelon or a click of success or whatever. I, and I think so much of it's because I'm sentimental about where I'm from. But I mean, I don't even know why I'm telling you this, but you just strike me as someone who has experienced so much more than just what you do and just that type of lifestyle. I don't know what I expected, but it's really cool. <laughs> Thanks, Haley. I feel the same way about you. This episode of Unqualified is supported by ThreadUp. Are you looking for a new summer wardrobe? And did you know that thrifting just one item instead of buying new saves on average 77 gallons of water and 17 pounds of carbon emissions? That makes me wonder, when items show up brand new with tags still on them, do I still get credit for saving the planet? ThreadUp is one of the world's largest online consignment and thrift stores carrying over 35,000 big name and luxury brands with low prices you won't find anywhere else. Zara from $6, Madewell and J.Crew as low as $9. I just got a great pair of Daisy Dukes from Free People for $25. Just customize your search by size, style and budget to find the best deals instantly. Shop handbags, shoes, accessories, activewear, sweaters, designer dresses, anything and everything from all your favorites. And with new arrivals, every minute, there's always something new to discover. They also have a super easy return policy to make thrifting worry-free. So get the styles you love at a fraction of the price. You'll look and feel good with ThreadUp. And for unqualified listeners, here's an exclusive offer just for you. Get an extra 30% off your first order at threadup.com slash Anna. That's T-H-R-E-D-U-P dot com slash A-N-N-A for 30% off your first order. Threadup.com slash Anna for an extra 30% off today. Terms apply. This episode of Unqualified is brought to you by McDonald's. And I want to talk to you about one of my favorite McDonald's items, the Big Mac. As I'm sure you're aware, each bite of a Big Mac is the perfect ratio of sesame seed bun, cheese, shredded lettuce, pickles, onions, and 100% all beef patty. And then, of course, there's the sauce, which is probably best described as a modern miracle. For some, the Big Mac is just one of McDonald's many great burgers. For me, it represents so much more. Part comfort food, part reward, and part family tradition, the Big Mac has been there for me for as long as I can remember. To celebrate a B in math after weeks of studying, lift my spirits when Ryan Gervon decided he wanted to go study with Michelle Leiden, or simply to calm my nerves on the way to the premiere of Scary Movie. Yeah, Ryan, you could have had a Big Mac too. As a side note, dipping your fries into a chocolate shake is also very effective when it comes to curing heartbreak. The McDonald's Big Mac, a burger with a sauce so special, You've got to use your fries to pick up the last drops. All right, let's talk about the future with you. We have to speculate where your idea of home is, because I don't know if you found it yet. I'm going to give you three scenarios to choose from. Okay. It's like any time in the future. Okay. One, you are in a log cabin in Finland, and there's like a mild snowstorm, and it's too cold to go outside, and there's that feeling of contentment. Okay. Two, you are in Paris on a balcony with your band, and you are looking at the Eiffel Tower. Okay. <laughs> Three, you're on a beach in Thailand, and it's like a gorgeous day, and there's like a man trying to sell you fish that he just caught. <laughs> All right. What do you think? 
I think it's probably on a balcony in Paris with my bandmates and the people that we you know travel with. And I don't necessarily see it as having to be as part of a tour, but I feel so content with all those people. It's such a family and I feel safe. I really think that is home, actually. And maybe the balcony could be anywhere, but especially since it's in Paris, I think I would love that. I really miss the feeling that I am somewhere, you know, maybe it's an airport terminal or maybe it's like a crappy pub. But if I'm with my people, that's home to me. I think that it's so interesting for you to bring up the concept of home right now because I'm really having a lot of identity issues around like what makes me feel at home with myself. And part of it, I think, is because we've been off the road for so long. And that was my escape. That was my sense of boundaries. That was like so much was tied up into being on the road. And I haven't had that in a really long time. And I think it's catching up to me today where I'm like, oh, I really miss that. But I mainly miss the people. You know, I miss my family that I have grown up with traveling with. Yeah. Have you ever written a fan letter? Yes, I wrote a fan letter to NSYNC when I was nine, and I was in their fan club. And You were in their fan club? An official? Yes. It was a big deal for me. <laughs> you say this with, like, you didn't make the band. <laughs> <laughs> I did feel that way. I learned about harmony from listening to them. It's really vulnerable to be a fan, though. Yeah, man. No joke. It really is. And I feel very grateful that I didn't grow up with that same obsession. Like it kind of faded out as I started writing my own music and whatever. Because I I have some friends that are still very much like this girl that I work with. She's like, I work for the Backstreet Boys now. And they don't know how insanely obsessed with them that I am. <laughs> it's like, like for me, my obsession with NSYNC faded Like, as soon as their band was over, it's like, you know, I would get a concert ticket if they came back right now. But I don't, I remember, though, being nine years old and being like, this is my life's calling. I'm just going to follow these people around and listen to everything that they say that they listen to. I mean, I was I was nine, you know, but I wrote them a letter and in my head, I thought it was like this profound thing. But my mom showed it to me the other day and it was like, (laughs) it had like... You know, in the 90s when people would draw those S's that look like the Superman S. And like, I think there was a picture that I had drawn of like a Sony Walkman with like music notes coming out of it. And it was just a letter that said, without a doubt, I'm the biggest fan that that you've ever had. And you should come to Meridian, Mississippi sometime. And then I guess here's some drawings, doodles of things like a Sony Walkman and a little dog with a flower. I think that's really sweet. That was it. I really love them. Yeah. You were part of the dream for a minute. Yes. Oh, man. And I I remember my dad took me to see them. I think I was nine or ten. And, like, it's so funny because I immediately was like, this is what I'm going to do with my life. I'm going to be on stage like that. I, like, always thought of myself being in a band, you know. But I think I had an appreciation that they really sang and, you know, that Justin did vocal arrangements. Like, I was really into the nerdy details, but... Yeah, so I have written a fan letter, only one that I know of. Having been through heartbreak, would you consider it that? Oh, yeah. I've I've experienced a lot of heartbreak. I think just because I wear my heart so close to the surface. I was listening to a TED Talk today about regenerative cells in your heart and how a broken heart, there are cells in the heart that die. And up until a certain age, like it's easier for your heart to regenerate those. And it almost made me cry listening to it because I was like, oh, I know that feeling so well. Like when your heart breaks and you physically feel it, like you feel something happen. Mm -hmm. I've experienced that over a lot of things, not just romantic relationships, but just plenty of stuff because life is heartbreaking. It's great, but it's also... I think if you're living it openly, it can be pretty heartbreaking. Yeah. Life experience makes one a more empathetic person. Yes. Which hopefully, you know, leads to less war. (laughs) (laughs) I fucking hope so. It doesn't look (laughs) promising. (laughs) But yeah, I mean, like I, God, man. And the like billions of different types of heartbreak and heartache that have happened just in the last year alone. i do get the feeling that there's people who their capacity for empathy has grown so much because of 
you know, the different types of letdowns and heartaches over the past year alone is very interesting to me. But I, I'm not the kind of person that when it happens, then I'm closed off. I still tend to run back in, you know, head first. Are you in a relationship though? Yes, I am. <laughs> you seem really happy. Yeah. There was a big grin on your face. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about it. You know, it's the first time that I've been in a relationship that I think is healthy. And so that in itself feels like a huge feat. And I really have to watch myself in my propensity to protect or be on the defense when I don't need to be just because of past experiences. And you can't help it. Like you're always carrying around the things that you've gone through and whatever. I don't even like to think of it as baggage because I'm trying really hard to reframe a lot of my past as something that's a tool and it's helping me forging a path for myself that I'm able able to do because of what I went through in the past. And, you know, I just feel like I certainly wouldn't be able to even be interested in romantic relationships if I wasn't in therapy, if I wasn't being active and working on myself. But yeah, I am happy. I feel safer than I did before I was open to being in a relationship again. For sure. Yeah, I hear you on that. And I never had like much of a hot temper, but I think a lot about like picking battles, like long gaming it. Yes. Embracing that idea has like been important to me. So what qualities drew you to your partner? What were you looking for that you obviously found? I mean, honestly, now that I've had some of the experiences that I have and I'm where I'm at today, I think the main quality is empathy, really. But it's also curiosity. I really appreciate curiosity. And, you know, I love talking and listening um, and having super long conversations that, you know, potentially go nowhere. But you don't really get that without curiosity. And of course, without empathy. And I like to think about philosophical bullshit. And then I also just like to joke about bullshit that means nothing. And I think that Having someone that you like around you and that you really respect, I've just never experienced that until recently. So it's, <laughs> it feels like a revelation to be able to have respect for someone that you love. I love that. So were you the leader of your divorce? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> what a weird way to phrase that. <laughs> <laughs> but like, how else are you supposed to describe it? I mean, yeah. <laughs> yes, I was. I also had never felt any sense of control throughout the entire relationship. So I feel like it was even scarier to initiate this process because it was like, oh, shit, it took me 10 years to find my voice. Now I'm doing this, you know. Was there infidelity involved? Yeah. We also both toured and it just doing that, but it was happening to me and it was uh, bad. <laughs> it's the best way to sum it up. <laughs> when you found out, what was your anger level, I guess, and shock level? Shock level wasn't very high. I think I'd been trying to prove it for a long time, but could never. I always think about like the insurrection, you know, shocked, but not surprised. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. How that's applicable in my life? <laughs> 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 yes, that's the best way to put it. Okay, you want to know what's crazy is when I found out, I know this is very personal and candid, and maybe that seems clumsy to some people, but it really is the best way, I think, for me in terms of healing is just to be able to express on some level, whether it's public or not. I remember looking at myself. I took a shower and I looked at myself in the mirror, and I'm not wearing any clothes, and I had a terrible self image because of this you know, unhealthy relationship I was in. And I just remember looking at myself in the face, really, and looking in my eyes and being like, you haven't been treated the way that you deserve to be treated. And there's got to be someone out there that sees you and actually sees you. And it's, it's not the person you're with. And it has never been the person that you're with. And so you need to figure that out. But it still took me months of back and forth, roller coastering, being like, I need to try to make this work because it's been so long. And then literally going through with a marriage after that, you know, Maya and I talked a little bit about because I think she had a similar experience, but getting up the courage to own my voice and really protect myself was a tough 
thing to come around to. And my anger was a tough thing to grasp. It took years for me to be honest about how mad I was. And I didn't even write about it until the first solo record I put out. And the first song of the whole album, the opening word is rage. And I bawled my brains out when I tracked those vocals because I was finally honest about how angry it made me. Was it other behavior besides the infidelity? Like, especially my first marriage, like the resentment coming from career? Yeah, I can't prove it, but I I also can't imagine that wasn't in there. You know, like now I'm like, I don't know that we ever talked about real things like that. So I don't even know. I so look back on that time as sort of being like play acting. Yes. Oh, my God. Oh, that resonates. There's nothing formal about this. (laughs) (laughs) Like we would have these crazy Hollywood parties all the time. Really? Like we were never alone together. Oh, I relate to that. So we never like, yeah. Man. Also, it's so weird, I think, when your jobs are also the only thing that keep you together. It's like, for me, with my situation, I don't know that we would have known each other if we weren't orbiting each other because of our job and and our music scene and all of that stuff. And sometimes I don't even know. Like, I was 18. I was really young when I got into that relationship. So a lot of me thinks it was ego of wanting to be with someone who did what I do. Maybe in a little way, I felt understood that he's already been through this, so he knows and I won't have to worry. But it actually was still a worry. It was like, no, we're only in each other's lives because of this. And it's the most that we have in common is this. Haley, I'm so like, I could check all those things that you just said off the list. But also in addition to that, for me, there was also, I felt so career, like, it was necessary to be so focused. Yeah. I do believe that. Yeah. Like achieving something that is really hard to do, it requires a lot. Yeah, yeah. And it was also scary in Los Angeles to think of myself being single. <sighs> yes. Yeah, I just wanted that a degree of security. Holy shit, I relate to that. <laughs> yeah. I get that. Yeah, so Haley, we just reframed it as like, man, we were just too ambitious. <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, <laughs> I do think that. And I feel like I guilted myself sometimes for that. So if we were people that were determined to fend for ourselves, then I think we're also the kind of people that couldn't help but sideline everything but career in our artistic dreams. (laughs) I feel like it's nice to have that framed in this way that is empowering versus being a defect, you know, being like, oh, something's wrong with you because you should be this way. Yeah, it took me a long time. But my ex pointed it out actually a lot. And then I was also like, yeah, all right. Yeah, fuck it. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Ah. I wanted a house. (laughs) Yes. Well, especially too, like, I remember growing up in Mississippi, we didn't have a lot. And there were parts of my childhood where my dad had money and there were parts that my family was broke. And I think I always just was like, I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to take care of my family or I'm going to whatever, you know. And yeah, I feel like way before I even knew I was going to do entertainment in any aspect, there was a longing to be self-sufficient and also to be able to provide some sense of security for myself and the people I care about. You know what just occurred to me, because I I feel very, like I want to talk to you forever because I feel a lot of kinship in you. Yeah. And we've had some similar experiences. So in the control of the narrative, I can really see why with both of you guys being so close with your band, Mm -hmm. and you must have felt like there was a need to get that narrative out, like he cheated on me Part of me did. It just took so fucking long, to be honest. And I think partly because I knew there would be either backlash or denial or whatever. But the thing that I keep telling myself is like, number one, the truth is the truth. And it doesn't really matter whose lips it comes out of. But number two, people have their own story. And I feel that it's really important for each of us to be able to have the freedom to tell our story. And, you know, I've said this before. I said this to my friend Zane, who I love doing interviews with for Paramore because I think he's so empathetic and and just emotionally intelligent. But I told him, I was like, 
everyone is a good guy and a bad guy. Depends on who you ask. Like, I'm sure my ex has plenty of bad to talk about me, just as I have plenty of bad, you know. But whether I agree or not, it doesn't matter. That To someone, he's a hero. To someone, I'm the hero. And that is such a really tough paradox for me to hold. But I'm like trying desperately as I get older to hold that it can be both and. Pretty much anything can be both and. And that's, I like things to be like, oh, put a stamp on that. This is what that is and make it simple. But unfortunately, people aren't simple enough for that. So anyway, I I do feel the need to have the freedom to tell a story about my life that is truth and that liberates me. But I understand that while it might be useful to some, it might be an inconvenience to other people. Haley, do you mind me asking your age? I'm 32. You're going to love your 40s. Oh, I cannot wait. It seems so freeing, man. A lot of the people that I look up to and listen to, whether it be podcasts or authors that I read, it's that same sense of like, there's so much freedom and like sense of control about just who you want to be. I don't know. 30s are definitely better than my 20s already, but I'm not scared of my 40s. I'm pumped. I'm like, get me out of the hellhole that is like whatever self-doubt comes with this younger age. I don't love it. It's not fun. Yeah, I know. I remember my early 30s feeling like that too. Because they make you feel like you're supposed to have everything figured out. Like if you don't have kids by the time you're this, it, you oh, know. Oh man, I know. That's so wrong. Like one of my favorite uh, bands is Radiohead. I mean, I feel like everyone would say that, but I really think it's so badass that Tom York and Johnny Greenwood just started another band together. And they're, I don't know how old they are, 50, 40 something. I don't know. But I looked at my bandmates the other day and I was like, can we just, when we're 50, just start a new band again? Like just because it is different with men probably, and at least my perception. But I like this idea of just being like, who the fuck can stop you from expressing and being good at what you're good at? just because you turned a certain age. Like nobody can render you talentless or storyless or whatever. I think if anything, if people are actually listening, you're getting deeper and you're like hopefully just getting more comfortable and better. I don't know. No, I think it is. I think that's like both advice and life experience rolled into one. Yeah. I want to know what I'm supposed to be like at 40. I think you're going to be in Paris. <laughs> yeah. Fuck, please. Oh, I love that. And maybe you'll just be backpacking through there. and mm -hmm. You can stop there and have some coffee with me. <laughs> Haley, I have loved so much talking to you. Me too. I really am so happy that I met you. I really am. It's so cool to speak with you and hear about the human side of you and not just see you on a TV or in a movie. It's been really enjoyable. I'm thankful. Me too. Thank you so much. Bye, Haley. Bye. This episode of Unqualified is brought to you in part by Sakara. Feeling your best starts with what you